Father, we thank you for each opportunity you give us to gather around your word and to learn. So, Father, open our hearts and our minds. Help us to, to hear and understand and know what you'd have us know and understand today. That, Father, more important than hearing, more important than knowing and understanding, may we be quick to put into practice your word in the days to come. Help us to do that. In your precious name, amen. Amen. Well, good morning. If I was at BG Club on a Thursday night, I would say, hello, everybody. And then all the kids would shout a response back at me, and we'd be set to go for another night of children's ministry. But this is a Sunday morning crowd, so a reserved good morning will do. I, I get it. That's fine. It's, appro- it's, it's appropriate. And it is a good morning. Today is Pentecost Sunday. I want to acknowledge that right at the beginning of this message. It's Pentecost Sunday today. Today is the day we celebrate the coming and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on all believers in a special and very significant way. I'm going to do some teaching this morning, and if you find it easier to follow along, there's an insert in your newsletter. And uh, if you want to follow along with that, that may make it easier for you today. I want to clear up a couple of misconceptions about Pentecost. I qualified this occasion today by saying that it is the coming of the Holy Spirit in a special way because the Holy Spirit already existed before this particular day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit always was. The Holy Spirit has always been a member of the Trinity. We should never think that Pentecost Sunday celebrates or signifies the start of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit was at work and we see it recorded long before what took place in the book of Acts. In Genesis 1 and verse 2, right at the time of creation, actually even before creation, you open your Bible to the very first page, and we read these words. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. I love the imagery in the sense of almost foreboding anticipation. Formless, darkness, nothingness, bleakness, oblivion, but the Spirit of God was brooding over the waters. The Spirit of God was present. And you right away get get a sense that because the Spirit was present, something great, something awesome was about to happen. And then creation begins. Life happened. The Spirit has been around forever. So we need to remember that Pentecost doesn't celebrate the beginning of the Holy Spirit. And another misconception about Pentecost Sunday is the notion that Pentecost has always been about the Holy Spirit. And this is especially a popular misconception among those that attend or are part of a Pentecostal church. And that's where you are this morning, by the way, just in case you weren't aware. Calvary Temple is a Pentecostal church. You can't just assume that everybody knows that anymore because a lot of people don't. And that's okay, but just know Calvary Temple is a Pentecostal church. I was born in Dauphin, Manitoba, and my parents dedicated me as a child in a Pentecostal church. I grew up in Winnipeg and attended a Pentecostal church in St. Vitale. I went and studied at a Pentecostal college. Every summer, I went to a Pentecostal camp. I attended a Pentecostal youth group. Since graduating from college for the last 25 years, I've been working in and ministering in Pentecostal churches. I'm Pentecostal through and through, both in belief, but also in experience and practice. It's who I am. And growing up, in the, Pente- in the Pentecostal church, every time that I heard the word Pentecostal, right away images or thoughts of the Holy Spirit came to mind. By word association, I just assumed that Pentecost and the Holy Spirit always went together, but it didn't, at least not always. Pentecost as a word had nothing to do with the Holy Spirit. It was a day on the calendar. It was a special day, a day of celebration, a holiday, but not a Christian holiday. The story that we find in Acts 2 didn't mark the first Pentecost. Pentecost had been celebrated for many years already. It was a Jewish day of celebration. The day of Pentecost means 50th day, and it annually marked the 50th day after the Passover. The Passover was another incredibly significant Jewish holiday. 
Pentecost in Old Testament times, hundreds of years before Christ, was called the Feast of Weeks, or the Feast of First Fruits, or the Feast of the Harvest. It would be more like our North American traditions of Thanksgiving. And somewhere along the way, because it was always 50 days after Passover, it started to be called the Day of Pentecost, or the 50th day. But there would be one particular Pentecost that became extremely important in history because on that particular Pentecost, God, the Holy Spirit, stepped in and poured out of himself in a way that he had never done before. Now remember, the Holy Spirit existed before. In fact, it's recorded several times in the Bible that the Holy Spirit interacted and worked in and through and among people before. But this was something different, something new. And we find an account of it in Acts chapter 2. I keep referring to Acts 2. If you don't know what Acts 2 is, just let me give you a real quick explanation of that. Acts 2 is a particular reference to a passage in the Bible. The Bible is broken into two main parts, the Old Testament, or the time before Christ, and the New Testament, the time during and after Christ. And the book of Acts is a history book of what took place during the days and years directly after the life of Christ. The title of the book, Acts, is actually short for the Acts of the Apostles. And chapter 2 in the book of Acts records an account of the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. That is what we're referring to when we talk about what took place in Acts chapter 2. And we'll look at that in just a moment. And you may ask yourself, well, if the Holy Spirit has always existed and has always been at work among people, then how was what happened on this particular day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 any different from how the way things were before? And to answer that, you need to look at an Old Testament prophecy given approximately 800 years earlier. And this is so neat how it all comes together. The prophet Joel prophesied, and we find it recorded in the book of Joel chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. It says this, and afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And now what takes place in Acts chapter 2 is a fulfillment of what was prophesied back in Joel chapter 2. And if you want to understand what was different about what took place in Acts chapter 2 from how the Holy Spirit bef worked before this point in history, then you need to circle that word all in what Joel said. Joel prophesied that the Spirit would be poured out on all people. You may think, well, that doesn't sound like such a big deal. But it is a big deal. Because this would have been difficult to understand in a male-dominated society. This would have been difficult to fathom in a caste or class type society with servants and slaves and captives and free. This would have been difficult to grasp in a society that viewed the worth of the young and the old quite differently. But Joel was clear. He said the Spirit would be poured out on all people. And it was like he knew right away that, that people may not understand that when he used the word all, he meant all. So he even begins to spell it out for us, the young and the old the sons and the daughters, the servants and the free, the men and the women, everyone. I don't fully understand how the Holy Spirit worked in Old Testament times. But he seemed to work sporadically, here and there, empowering one person and then leaving, and being more significant in the life of one person, but virtually non-existent in the life of another. There definitely isn't this sense of the Holy Spirit being available and poured out on all people, until Acts chapter 2. And again, we, before we look at Acts chapter 2, I want to look at another prophecy. And this one isn't 800 years before Acts chapter 2, but rather a few weeks before Acts chapter 2. The prophecy comes from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ himself. And this is before his crucifixion, and he was sharing some important final thoughts with his closest followers, his closest friends. And he's telling them that he's going to be taken away from them. And this obviously causes some angst and concern among them. But Jesus wants to comfort his disciples and let them know that they will never be alone. 
And we find these words of Jesus in John chapter 14, starting at verse 15. It says this, If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. The Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. What a picture of Jesus caring for his disciples, for his friends. The illustration of an orphan is a powerful one, but Jesus tells them that he won't leave them alone. He is sending a counselor. He's not going to leave them as orphans. So who is this counselor that Jesus is talking about? Is it a person? Will it be a professional grief counselor to help the disciples cope with the death of Jesus? Who is Jesus talking about? It's made a little clearer for us a few verses later in verse 25. And again, these are the words of Jesus to his disciples. He says, all this I have spoken while still with you. But the counselor, the Holy Spirit, there it is spelled out right there. The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that I've said to you. And then those famous words of comfort. Words that are often quoted at a funeral. Jesus continues, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. I mean, those are great words of comfort. But when they're quoted all by themselves, it can be forgotten that they go hand in hand with what Jesus said about the coming of the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So, you have the prophet Joel telling us that the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out on all people. And then Jesus, weeks before the event, declaring words of comfort that we will not be left alone, but the Holy Spirit is coming to be with us. Now let's get a little closer to the date of the account of Acts chapter 2. And we find some more words of Jesus in Acts chapter 1. Now this time, only 10 days before what happened in Acts chapter 2. Jesus says this, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. I mean, this is, this is so amazing. Jesus even begins to qualify when this event is going to happen. The fulfillment of the prophecy prophesied 800 years earlier was about to be fulfilled in a few days. Not just sometime way down in the future, but just a few days. This is what they had been waiting for was about to be fulfilled. It's exciting. And I also want to point out that Jesus notes the baptism of John as something different than the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They are two separate events in the life of the believer. Another misconception about the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 is that it was the birth of the church. That's not really correct. Nor was it the beginning of Christianity. It had already started before this. John had been baptizing people for a while already. Jesus had disciples and followers already. The church or Christianity had already begun before Acts chapter 2. We had a water baptismal service here just a few weeks ago, and it was a wonderful service where people publicly declared that they had chosen to follow Christ. They chose the way of Christianity, and they stated they're going to follow Jesus for the rest of their lives. It was a great service. And that baptism is different from the baptism in the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit enables and empowers believers to live as God wants us to live. It's a separate event in the life of the believer, and Jesus indicates that for us here. Now here's the last thing, the last thing that Jesus says. He says in verse 8 of Acts chapter 1, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Then the passage continues, and it says this, And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. There it is, the purpose of the Holy Spirit in our lives, to empower us to be his witnesses. Acts chapter 2, while it may not be labeled as the birth of the church, could be labeled as the explosion of the church 
an explosion of significant evangelistic and missionary work because people are about to become empowered by the baptism of the Holy Spirit and there's going to be no stopping the church from that point on. Okay, so now we're ready for Acts chapter 2. 800 years earlier, Joel had said the Holy Spirit was coming and that he would be for all people. Then only weeks before the event, Jesus said that he's leaving, but that he would send the Holy Spirit so his followers wouldn't be alone. And finally, only days before, Jesus gives the purpose of the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and it was to empower believers to be witnesses. So let's see what happens. Acts 1 and verse 12 says, Then they returned to Jerusalem. Then on in verse 13, When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Maybe you've heard of the upper room referred to and wondered what was being talked about. Well, this is where that reference comes from. It simply says they went upstairs, the upper room. It's as simple as that. Then a list of some of the people that were in the upper room is there. And then, and then in verse 14, they all joined together constantly in prayer. There's that word all again. They all join together constantly in prayer. And that word all is significant because look at the very next phrase. What does it say? They all join together constantly in prayer along with the woman. Luke was the author of the book of Acts, and he didn't just write that in there as a passing comment. He wanted to make sure that it was noted there. He wanted us to know that the women were there. Because this was going to be the beginning of the fulfillment of the prophecy in Joel, from Joel chapter 2. The Spirit was going to be poured out on all people, not just some, not just the elite, not just the men, not just the good old boys, but all people. The women were there. Acts 2 and verse 1 now. Then, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. And now here it is. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. All of them. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, I don't understand exactly what the wind was all about. And I don't understand exactly what was that looked like fire that came to rest on each one of them. I don't understand what that was all about. Perhaps significant because this was the first time the Holy Spirit fell this way. But I don't think we hear about wind or fire like that in Scripture again. But what did have a lasting effect and was recorded about again and again and again from this point on was this, that the believers in Christ became powerful witnesses for Jesus like never before. People were being added to the church every day, sometimes by the hundreds. The church exploded in evangelism, and there was no stopping it. Boldness came over the believers to live and share their faith like never before. Now this is... Peter comes out from, from the upper room and the crowds outside where they were, were, were staying were, were questioning what was going on inside and, and, and even making fun of what was happening. But Peter gets up and he preaches a powerful message. He comes out from that upper room and he preaches a message and 3,000 people choose to follow Christ and join the church right there on the spot. And this is the same Peter who days before had denied that he even knew who Jesus was. But now empowered by the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he preaches a type of message that could get him thrown in prison or even executed, and 3,000 people respond to the message. The administrative side of me right away sees the immediate, wonderful administrative nightmare that would have been caused. We're growing so fast. 3,000 in one day. How are we going to keep track of everyone? Where are we going to find a place to meet? I wonder how much it is to rent the local arena for our services. How are we going to advertise those services? How about the kids and the youth programs? Where are we going to find all the leaders from? Everyone's a new Christian, so no one knows anything yet. What doctrine is everyone going to be teaching our kids? No one, e no one even knows each other yet. How can we do any background checks on our leaders? The plan to protect program is right out the window. Everyone is a stranger. And our church directory went from one page in a day to the size of a large phone book just in one day. How are we going to get all those people into our database? It's a wonderfully exciting time, I'm sure. 
The outpouring of the Holy Spirit created many wonderful problems that needed to be walked through and solved, but those days would have been tremendous, I'm sure. So the pouring out of the Spirit in Acts 2 was to empower believers to be witnesses for Jesus. And Peter gets up now, baptized in the Holy Spirit, and he preaches. And what does he preach? He preaches from Joel chapter 2. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. And he reads and he preaches the whole passage. So we've come full circle. Joel said it was for all people. Jesus said he wasn't going to leave us alone. Jesus said he was going to, it was going to be to empower people to be his witnesses. Then the Holy Spirit falls on the day of Pentecost, and the prophecy is fulfilled, and the church explodes in power. So that is what we celebrate today on Pentecost Sunday. The pouring out of the Holy Spirit in a special way on all believers. Pastor Gary preached a, a great message on the Holy Spirit a couple of weeks ago, and, and I appreciate the words that he left for us in his insert today. If you have your insert there, you can pull it out. We've got the words on the screen, though, too. He reminds us of this. The great news this Pentecost Sunday, this is from Pastor Gary, the great news this Pentecost Sunday is not that we have a great historical event, but that we have a great present and future experience. Acts 2, verse 39 says, The promise is for you and your children and to all who are afar off. That's us. That's our children and all who come after. The promise continues. May his Holy Spirit continue to fill us with power. Amen. That's a great reminder from our pastor today. It isn't just an event that we celebrate in the past, but we recognize that it's for all believers today as well. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is for you and it's for me. That's wonderful news. So where does that leave us today? There's something that, that I've been thinking about this year quite a bit. It's actually a line from a song that keeps going through my head. And, and we sang the song again today. The song is entitled, Holy Spirit. It's wonderful to sing a song called, Holy Spirit, on Pentecost Sunday. Good choice of songs. And there's a line in that song that just has taken root in my heart, and I've been mulling it over and over. And I don't know if, if you can have a theme prayers for your life, but if you can, my theme prayer for 2016 has been, let us become more aware of your presence. Hmm. Just pause for a moment and let that prayer, that line from that song, sink into your heart and mind. Let us become more aware of your presence. Personalize it for yourself. Let me become more aware of your presence. You see, God is here. The Holy Spirit is here. And if we aren't experiencing all God has for us, if we're not sensing the leading of the Holy Spirit, or the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, it isn't because he isn't here, because the Holy Spirit is here. He is here. Our prayer needs to turn from, Come Holy Spirit, I need thee, which is a song that we used to sing, and there's nothing wrong with that old great chorus. It's a beautiful song. And, and you could probably argue that it is just semantics, and God knows our heart, and knows what we mean when we sing the words of that old song. We, we understand that God is here. But I like this new song because it helps me remember that God is here. The Holy Spirit is here. And I need to remember that it is me that needs to become more aware of his presence. It's me that needs to dial in and tune in to his presence. It's me that needs to allow myself to be led by and empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's not so much us waiting for God to show up, but rather realizing that God is here and that he is waiting for us to acknowledge his presence. Let us become more aware of your presence. What a great prayer to pray. You see, I believe living with an awareness of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives would be a remedy to a lot of things. You just act differently when you know that you're not alone. Jesus said, I will send the counselor to you so you won't be like orphans. You won't be alone. You may act a certain way when you, when you think you're the only person in the room. But as soon as someone walks in, something changes. We act differently. We have to. Society dictates to us that we're to act a certain way when we encounter each other. God created us as social beings. We automatically conduct ourselves differently, hopefully appropriately, when someone else is around. Have you ever been caught 
singing to yourself or talking to yourself when you thought no one was around to hear you and then you, then you realize that someone else was actually in your shot and they heard everything that you said and every off-key note that you sang, it can be embarrassing. Why? Because you weren't aware that someone else was present. Now, getting caught singing or talking to yourself, well, there's no harm in that. It may just be a little embarrassing. But let's take that a little further now. You ever get caught doing something that you weren't supposed to be doing because you thought no one else was around? That can be more than just a little embarrassing. It can be devastating or hurtful. It can have grave consequences. And we know we wouldn't have done it if we knew that someone was around watching us. Well, someone always is around The Holy Spirit is always around. God is always around. And we just forget that he's around sometimes. I believe if we prayed more often, let me become more aware of your presence. If I prayed that prayer more often, I believe we would truly live differently. We would make choices differently. We would react to situations differently. We would stand up to temptation, and we'd be bolder in our representation of Jesus Christ. We would be quicker and bolder to share our faith with others if we prayed that prayer more often. Why? Because we are more aware that God is with us, and the Holy Spirit is with us and empowering us. God not only wants us to sense his presence when we gather here together and worship in here, And this is a great place for us to experience the presence of God and be aware of the Holy Spirit. But the same Spirit that we sense in here wants to be recognized and acknowledged throughout our entire day. You see, the times that I mess up in life are times that I've forgotten that the Holy Spirit is watching. The times that I fall into temptation are when I'm unaware that the Holy Spirit is with me. The times that I make wrong choices or react to situations in a manner that's not very Christ-like are times that I have forgotten that the Holy Spirit is here. And when I miss opportunities to represent Jesus, it's because I'm not tuned in to the presence of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is here, and he wants to work in us. He wants to fill us and baptize us with his power, power to live right and power to be his witnesses, power to share our faith with others in word and with the example of a holy life lived out before God. I need to remember that whether I'm in the sanctuary with a group of believers worshiping together or sitting alone in my office, or whether I'm at home or in my car or in the store or in the classroom or in the gym or wherever I am, the Holy Spirit is there with me. I just need to acknowledge and be aware that he is there. And it will cause me to live different. It will cause me to live better. It will cause me to live holy. And an awareness of God's presence or the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives should bring peace to those experiencing a sense of sadness or grief or loneliness. And it should bring conviction when we need to be corrected and help us stand up to temptation. It will give wisdom to those who need to make decisions today. It will give boldness to every believer to make us witnesses for Christ. And on this Pentecost Sunday, let's make it our prayer. Lord, let us become more aware of your presence today. Now, living with an awareness of the presence of God doesn't mean living in such a way that you're no longer in touch with reality around you doesn't mean that you walk around holding a big Bible for everyone to see or with your head down, your eyes closed, your hands raised in some posture of prayer all the time. It doesn't mean being so super spiritual that you you live with this pious or self-righteous state so that nobody can stand being around you. It just means recognizing God's presence is with you in the everyday aspects of life and allowing the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you and work through you. Reverend David Wells, our general superintendent, for the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada, has been using a phrase that I really love. He's been encouraging us to learn to live naturally supernatural. And his prayer is that we would learn to live in such a way that the supernatural would become such a common thing in our lives, it would just become a natural, normal way of life for us. Not weird or out of the ordinary, but rather natural and normal part of our lives that we would find ourselves talking about the truths of God's word and how the word applies to our lives on a daily basis. The prayer would become, that prayer would be a common practice and not just the last resort in dire circumstances. 
That we would see miracles and healings and people being transformed as they choose to follow Christ and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that these things would become common. Not that they are no longer special or significant, but they would just become a normal part of our everyday lives as good followers of Jesus. This is his heart's cry for our denomination and our churches across our country. That we would learn to live naturally supernatural. And how do we do that? Well, I think it starts with us learning to be aware that the Holy Spirit is here. And he's with us. Today is Pentecost Sunday. Joel said the Holy Spirit was for everyone. That includes you. and includes me. Jesus said he wasn't going to leave us alone, that he would send the Holy Spirit. And he says it's to empower us to be his witnesses, to live holy lives for the world to see, and for us to declare our faith in him. Let's pray together. Let's bow our heads. Lord, let us become more aware of your presence. Let us become more aware of your presence. Your presence that is always with us. And Father, we pray that that awareness of your presence that goes with us throughout our day would affect how we live, how we conduct ourselves, decisions that we would make, our reactions to situations, the words that we would speak to one another and to those that we come in contact with. Father, help us to be aware of your presence. Holy Spirit, help us to be aware of your presence. Thank you, God, that you go with us. Holy Spirit, thank you that you are there to empower us and lead us and guide us and work through us in wonderful ways. Holy Spirit, thank you that you are there when we're experiencing sadness or grief, loneliness. Thank you that you are there. Thank you that you are there to to keep us in the right path for our lives and help us to conduct ourselves in in a manner that would be Christ-like. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for being there. Holy Spirit, thank you for empowering us to share your word with others that we come in contact with. Open our eyes to see the situations and people around us in ways that we can minister for you. Holy Spirit, thank you that you are there. Holy Spirit, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your presence. May we not forget that you are present with us all the time. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Hmm. Let's stand together. Closing. Our altars will be open for prayer. Prayer teams will come and make themselves available to pray with you. And I'd love to have the opportunity of praying with you as well. What a great prayer for us to pray and to pray every day. God, Holy Spirit, help us to become more aware of your presence today. And may that awareness of your presence affect every aspect of my life and how I choose to live today. If you have a need and would like someone to pray with you, maybe God has been challenging your heart with something today, we'd love to pray with you. I didn't talk a lot about receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit today, but if that is something you desire, we can pray with you for that as well. Feel free to linger in the sanctuary and meditate and pray for as long as you wish. We're in no rush today. The worship teams and musicians will continue to minister with us as, as long as it takes. And you can leave when you're ready. Thank you for coming today. God bless you for coming today. If you'd like prayer, come as the worship team ministers. Blessings on the rest of your day and on the rest of your week.